Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 12, The Age of Alexander, India and the Journey's End. In our last episode, we followed the progress of Alexander in the lands of Bactri and Sogdiana. Though the region was now pacified, the toll of the campaign was visibly wearing down the Macedonian army. The murder of Clytus the Black and the conspiracy of the pages caused great concern for the soldiers and officers. But Alexander, never one to miss an opportunity for further glory, could not rest on his laurels. Beyond the Hindu Kush lay the reaches of a land hitherto unknown to most Greeks, a land more myth than reality. Alexander sought to invade the last of his great conquests, the realm of India. Now, before we begin, I need to clarify what exactly do I mean when I say India. The region of the world that Alexander would conquer between the years 327 and 325 BC would actually be located in modern-day Pakistan and the Punjab, the border of his empire snaking down the Indus River to the Arabian Sea. And he technically never entered the India of our time. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I will continue to refer to this as India, the term used by the Greeks to refer to the lands and peoples of the Indus Valley. In fact, the Greek Indoi, or Indian, translates to the people of the Indus River. These people, described as being extremely tall and excellent warriors, had only appeared on the peripheral in the Greek historical tradition, being listed as soldiers in the exotic armies of the great king of Persia. The rest is in the realm of legends and myth. I mean, one only needs to read about the gold-digging ants in Herodotus which in all reality is probably just a species of marmot, a large mountainous rodent. The tropical weather and climate of the region was very alien as well, completely different from the seasonality of the Mediterranean. India's climate is dominated by the South Asian monsoon, a period of time between June and October where a reversal of ocean winds results in one of the world's most productive rainy seasons, with massive amounts of precipitation that grant life-sustaining water, turning formerly arid regions into agricultural hotspots. The downside to all of this rainfall is that it completely changes the landscape, making dirt roads a logistical nightmare of soupy, muck-filled passes, and the swelling of the rivers can make water travel treacherous. I mean, any invading army in India, especially considering the 19th century British invasion of the continent, can attest to how treacherous this whole thing can be. With his supply lines secure thanks to the aid of Oxyrathes, the king moved through the Hindu Kush a second time in the summer of 327. As he embarked along the Kafis River, now the modern Kabul River, he received an envoy of a number of local Indian rulers west of the Indus. The most prominent of these was a king named Takshilis, well, that probably wasn't his name, since his kingdom was centered around the wealthy and prosperous city known as Takshila. But we can guess it was probably just a title, since this aged Takshilis would soon die of old age, and be succeeded by his son Omphis, perhaps the Greek's translation of the Sanskrit Ambis. And confusingly, Omphis would also take the name Takshilis upon inheriting the throne. Anyways. Takshili's envoys came to Alexander bearing gifts of treasure and, making their debut appearance, war elephants. Takshili Sr. was convinced by Takshili Jr. to conclude an alliance with the Macedonians in order to aid their struggles with the numerous Rajas who all competed for domination of the subcontinent. Alexander accepted the proposal and with great use made use of Takshili's auxiliaries and knowledge of the politics and topography of the region. With the alliance confirmed and a path to India secure, Alexander made the observation that, with a year's worth of accumulated travel and plunder, their baggage train would be way too burdensome on their mobility into the lands unknown. So, ordering much of the goods loaded onto wagons, he set them all on fire. Starting with his first, before moving down the ranks, 
Now, few complained, and the army may have either been too fearful or genuinely moved by the king's willingness to abandon his own goods in solidarity with the rank and files. Alexander ordered Hyphestion and Perdiccas to proceed to the Indus River, clear a safe pass, and bridge it before the rest of the army could cross it. The Macedonians were immediately thrust into the vicious fighting that would demonstrate the brutality characterizing the Indian campaign. The army was ambushed by the forces of an unnamed Indian city, with Alexander and Ptolemy being wounded in the melee. The Phalangites, enraged at the injuries suffered by their king, decided that no prisoners would be taken when they broke into the city. They then proceeded to Andaka, whose population surrendered on sight of the Macedonian army. But the inhabitants of the nearby city tried to torch their own homes and fled unarmed towards the mountains. Little pity was given by King Alexander, and he ordered the cavalry to run them down and leave no soul alive. Again, in the city of Masaka, which was put under siege in the winter of 327-326, the Masakans inside actually reached negotiations with Alexander and promised to serve as auxiliaries if Alexander spared the city. Now, in Arian's account, the Masakans, deciding that they didn't want to bear arms against other Indians, fled in the cover of night, and upon word of this betrayal, the king ordered them to be massacred, and proceeded to sack the city in revenge. But the account of Plutarch and Diodorus instead posits an act of treachery on the Basileus part, where Alexander arranged a treaty while inside the city, and once the Masakan soldiers stepped foot outside the city walls, the Campania cavalry was sent to cut them down. Along with this, Alexander captured several philosophers, members of the Brahmin religious caste who held considerable sway in the region and were reportedly inciting rebellion. These he had executed to deter any resistance. It stands to reason that we should be surprised at the level of violence inflicted upon the region. Alexander certainly had his moments of rage and anger, especially during long and protracted sieges with resistant towns such as Thebes or Tyre, and he had to inflict shock and terror campaigns to induce the rebellious Bactrians and Sogdians to beckon to his heel. These were relatively within the standards of ancient warfare, where it was generally considered justified, quote-unquote, to sack a city that was given the chance to surrender but refuses. These acts of brutality are a different story, and one may question if the sources have suddenly turned into an anti-Alexandrian rhetoric. But in fact, Ptolemy's account becomes more prominent than ever, since it was in India that he received a high command and was made a general of the Macedonian army and so he went into extensive detail about it in his memoirs. So it is hard to believe that he would play up Alexander as being a murderous scourge upon the region. And Plutarch describes the actions against the Masakans as a blot on the otherwise chivalrous career of Alexander who obeyed the rules of war. Pothos, the desire for glory, did not fail to make its appearance. In the spring of 326, a rebel group formed by Bazirans and various other Indian towns gathered at the top of the Rock of Aornos, a translation of Avarana, hiding place, and is now known as the modern Pirsar, a mountainous peak laden with spring water, plenty of wood, and fertile agricultural land, and had a reputation for being so fortified and defensible that even legendary heroes like Heracles could not capture it. With this last point, and the fact that capturing or defeating these rebels would probably keep his supply line safe, Alexander made his plan. The forces of Ptolemy, Perdiccas, and Hyphestion would each be sent to secure their land around Iornos to prevent any additional reinforcements for the rebels. Then came the challenge of actually reaching the rock, since there lay a large chasm that kept the Macedonian engineers from deploying siege weapons. So, the construction of a mole was required and the soldiers filled the chasm with a framework of wooden stakes and earth. After four days of doing this, the rock had been reached, and the Indians, terrified of the swift progress, sent word to the king of surrender. They purportedly were doing this only to delay capture, 
and they eventually planned to flee, but to no avail. The king got wind of this ahead of time, and ordered the escaping rebels to be run down. And thus, the rock that even a demigod couldn't conquer had been taken, and the last great siege of Alexander's career. Since the east was always a land covered in mythological veneer, and this was about as far east as you could get, performing Heraclean feats was not the only divine thing on Alexander's agenda. In the city of Nysa, which was being planned to be besieged, Alexander received a diplomatic visit by the Nysan leader, begging the king not to sack the city. He apparently tried to reason that Alexander that the city was a holy ground for Dionysius, the youthful and ruddy-faced god of wine and ecstasy, who also had the legendary status of having once conquered India. Somewhere, the entomology of the name Nysa is derived from the god's nursemaid who also was named Nysa, and it was confirmed by the presence of ivy, a bona fide hallmark of the god's presence. Sacrifices were performed, and even rumors of a drunken Bacchic frenzy amongst the officers were reported. These mythological claims are always dubious, something that Arian and or the 3rd century geographer Eratosthenes cast doubt upon, given the immense propaganda value it would have for Alexander to visit these locations and walk the footsteps of the divine. In some respects, this part of the world was so remote, who was to say that what was and what wasn't part of the mythology of the land? Alexander would adopt the motif of Dionysius and Heracles in his art, and probably felt justified to do so, since he was either beating their achievements or, at the very least, matching them step by step. With this area secure, in the spring of 326, Alexander made for the bridge that Hyphestion had built upon the Indus probably made by lashing together numerous boats in a style reminiscent of the pontoon bridge of Darius and Xerxes in the Greco-Persian Wars. Having received supplies from Takshiles and a favorable omen for crossing, Alexander now had reached the modern state of the Punjab, the land of the five rivers. These five rivers include the Indus and its main tributaries, the Jhelum or the Hydaspes, the Chenab, the Ravi, Sutlej, and Bayas. The local Raja of the Paravan region, a man named Poros, or Parava, was Takshili's primary rival, ruling the area between the Hydaspes and the Chenab. He was an immensely tall figure, apparently towering over Alexander at roughly six and a half feet, and was a warrior of great renown and power, commanding a large army and a slew of war elephants. He had been aware of Takshili's and Alexander's alliance and their movements for the past year or so, and fearing the inevitable invasion of his kingdom, he decided to make a last stand on the southern bank of the Hydaspes and prepare for the worst. Arriving at the northern bank of the Hydaspes, Alexander realized that this would be no easy victory. The army of Porus, numbering some 40,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry, and approximately 100 war elephants was well stationed along the various choke points of the river. In addition, the river itself was greatly swollen and particularly treacherous, since it was now May or June, prime monsoon season. Perhaps in remembrance of the lessons learned at the Granicus, Alex thought that the best course of action would be to split the Macedonians into many separate forces and constantly move them about, to put pores into doubt upon his location. He also ordered a shipment of grain to be brought in full view, giving the impression that Alexander was going to try to buckle down and wait out the monsoon season. In theory, Alexander wanted to get troops across the river in a similar manner he did at the Danube River ten years earlier, by stuffing skins with hay and creating little floats to ferry his men. The only problem were the elephants. Loud and large, with the average Indian subspecies weighing in at about 8,000 pounds and standing over 10 feet tall, controlled by their aggressive drivers, the Mahouts. These new beasts were terrifying to the Macedonians, and in particular, the horses, who were unfamiliar to the noise and scent of the beasts. So, in order to reach a point where there were no elephants, Alexander pulled another trick out of his sleeve. He made nightly sorties or at least pretended to make one, 
and he would actually retreat once Porus had sent his troops in a panic to cover their flanks in response to all the noise. After the umpteenth time of doing this, Porus just got sick of it and stopped paying attention to these false alarms. With these tricks in place, Alexander had also made up his mind of where he wanted to cross. In the river lay a promontory, a small jut of land that allowed for the crossing of the Macedonian forces, obscured the sight of Poros. Returning to camp, he ordered the general Craterus to take a hipparchy of the companion cavalry, a couple battalions of the phalanx, and several thousand Indian auxiliaries to the riverbank and distract Poros. Alexander himself would take the main body of the companions, Bactrian, Sogdian, and Scythian cavalry, Agrianian light troops, and shield bearers across the promontory. In the cover of night, aided by a ferocious thunderstorm that masked the movements of the Macedonians, Alexander used the floats to cross the river to transport the men. He and a number of bodyguards, including Ptolemy, Perdiccas, Lysimachus, and making his debut onto the stage, Seleucus, all took a boat across to the southern bank of the Hydaspes. Unfortunately for Alexander, the riverbank actually turned out to be a second island, and another stream still had yet to be forded across. Poros, never entirely buying Alexander's tricks, had placed scouts along the river just to be safe, and they caught sight of the crossing Macedonians and fled back to alert Poros. The king then managed to reach a ford to get off the island, but the water level was so high that it actually lapped at the nape of their horses and men that were barely treading water. Reaching dry land, he arranged his battle line, numbering 15,000 Macedonians and auxiliaries, along with 5,000 cavalry forces. It wouldn't be long before the first wave of Indians, a contingent of cavalry and chariots led by the son of Poros, would be arriving to fight. Porus Jr. was as skilled of a warrior as his father, and managed to wound Alexander and Bucephalus, Alexander's beloved steed, before being slain himself in a retreat. Porus remained in doubt upon what to do. News of the failure to prevent Alexander's crossing was distressing, but immediately across from him on the northern bank lay Craterus and the other Macedonians who were itching to fight. Porus decided to push the bulk of his army to fight Alexander head-on, leaving only a few elephants to frighten Craterus's troops. Once he reached solid ground, Porus deployed his forces, spacing out his elephants in a line to prevent the forces of Alexander from daring to proceed between them. Behind them stood the bulk of his infantry, some armed with short swords, while others equipped with shields and spears. In addition were archers, men who wore a white kilt and a kind of turban, wielding bows made of bamboo that were as tall as the user who wielded them. On each wing remained the cavalry and the chariots, and in the center of all this was Porus, cutting an imposing figure while seated atop his mighty war elephant as a mahout. Despite seeing the enemy lined up and ready for battle, Alexander knew that the crossing was taxing on the soldiers. Looking to give them a break, he did not pursue combat immediately, but he had his cavalry perform a screening maneuver in order to provide some ample time for the infantry to catch their breath and line up. The center phalanx was commanded by Seleucus and Antigones. First, Alexander sent his mounted archers to harass and distract the Indians' left wing. Alexander took one portion of the companion forces and wheeled around the left flank of the Indians and attacked the line from behind, while a hipparchy led by Koinos would swing around Porus's right flank. Indian cavalry had desperately charged towards Alexander's cavalry in order to save their comrades but were then trapped in between two when Koinos arrived on the scene, and then were sent back fleeing to the front lines towards the elephants. In an attempt to save their rear, the Mahouts then drove their elephants back towards Alexander's forces, but the phalanx and the infantry of the Macedonians were pushed to attack the elephants, aiming javelins at the riders on top of them in hopes of causing the elephants to lose their sense of direction. It seems that Alexander's veterans, despite facing these giant unknown beasts, managed to use their experience, discipline, and superior numbers to remain steady. The elephants were heavily wounded or missing their riders, and now were crushed between the spears of the phalanx and the noise of the companions cutting down the lines behind them. In their misery, they turned to stampeding and attacking the nearest living thing around them. The scene must have been pretty nightmarish. 
The elephants trumpeting and trampling friend and foe to death, while light infantry hacked away at their trunks and legs with axes or specially curved swords. The Indian infantry, surrounded by the companions and phalanx slowly being pressed upon them and cut down to a man. The men left behind in the camp of Craterus had now crossed the river, and were a fresh relief for the now spent Alexandrian forces. And upon this sight, the burden of battle was too much to bear, and the Indians began to flee through whatever means they could. The battle was now effectively over. The Battle of the Hydaspes, as it is now known, was the last great battlefield victory for Alexander, and was arguably his most taxing in terms of generalship and costly in terms of lives. The Macedonians lost approximately 1,000 men, according to modern estimates, and there were a number of close calls that might have thrown the whole thing into jeopardy. His beloved horse, Bucephalus, long having served since Alex was but a young princeling, had been heavily wounded on the battlefield and died in the camp the next day, and the king would found the city of Bucephala in his honor. Despite the setbacks, Alexander's display of genius yet again shines here, compensating for any initial errors by making on-the-fly adjustments. The whole affair was captured in a series of medallions commemorating the victory over Porus, which were unearthed in the mid-1970s in Iraq, and published in a work by Frank Lee Holt entitled Alexander the Great and the Mystery of the Elephant Medallions. Thanks to his victory over the elephants, the use of this motif would remain distinctively Alexandrian in its tone. Now, I'd love to talk more about this, but I plan to delve more in a later episode where we can discuss the elephant in the Hellenistic world as a whole, and we have enough on our plate in terms of the whole Indian campaign. We can also say that the loss of so many Macedonians is probably due to the ferociousness of the Indian fighters, and Poros was certainly no Darius III. He had lost two of his sons, roughly 15 to 20,000 men, but had not fled the battlefield until he was heavily wounded and was one of the last men standing. Perhaps out of respect for Porus' bravery, or sensing his potential usefulness, Alexander did not order for him to be executed. He instead sent for Porus to be captured alive and be brought before him. Alex asked Porus how did he wish to be treated, to which the Indian Raja replied, as a king. So, Alexander raised him to this level of satrap, allowing him to rule over his domain and even added territory to it. And Porus would remain ever loyal to Alexander and the House of the Argiads for the rest of his life. Though he had gained an ally, Alexander taking Porus into the fold had also garnered some enemies. Word of the victory at the Hydaspes had spread. And while some of the kings had offered surrender, some did not. Alexander proceeded to raise the city of Sangala along the Chenab, and having reached this point, he learned that another Porus, known as the quote-unquote bad Porus, was currently preparing an army along the eastern bank of the Bayas River. It was here that the good Porus explained to Alexander that India stretched far further than what he believed, deep into the subcontinent, and there lay a great power to the east. The Nanda Empire, currently at the height of its territorial extent, was stretching along the northern area of the subcontinent, and could wield something to the effect of 200,000 warriors and over 4,000 elephants. Now, the thought of a whole new empire to conquer positively tickled Alexander's delight. But, for his men, this was too much. The amount of effort and time it had taken to conquer a relatively small piece of a much larger pie was daunting. To say the least, they had to put their foot down. In the summer of 326, along the banks of the Bayas River, the long-tired Macedonian army led a mutiny and refused to trek onwards. It should be clarified that mutiny is probably way too strong of a word. Elizabeth Carney, in a paper discussing Macedonian discipline, points out that the connotations of the ancient authors suggest the equivalent of a sit-down, where there is no rebellious threat against the king, but instead just in a bargaining attempt to talk Alexander out of continuing further. Alexander made an appeal to the bravery and past successes of his troops, asking why, after conquering all the nations that ever stood before them, do they suddenly shy away? If they do not proceed further, what kind of a man could go back home from the possibility of a world empire? Quote, 
For those who labor and face dangers achieve noble deeds, and it is sweet to live bravely and die leaving behind an immortal fame." End quote. A long pause then occurred. Koinos, one of the cavalry officers, stepped forth. He acknowledged that, thanks to the bravery and genius of the king, victory was certainly what they had. But victory had come at a price. How many men who left Macedon before were still standing? How many died or were left in garrisons across the vastness of the East and Asia? Enough was enough. They were homesick and hadn't seen their wives or children in Macedon in over nine years. How long would their fortune hold? Quote, Finally, sire, nothing is so honorable as self-restraint in the midst of good fortune. For while you are in command of such an army, we have nothing to fear from our enemies. But it is not in men's power to anticipate and thereby guard against what comes from God. A cheer erupted from the soldiers, much to the anger of Alexander. The king broke off the assembly, only calling it back the next day with the proclamation that he would continue on to India alone if no one else would. He returned to his tent, perhaps bluffing to see if his army would change their minds at the statement. But nobody came forth. And Alexander, just as Achilles did on the beaches of Troy, returned to his tent and sulked, refusing to come out. The tension could be cut with a knife, while the soldiers awaited anxiously for their king's next move. Upon the third day, however, the king stepped out of the tent and performed sacrifices to see if the omens for crossing the river were favorable. They were not. So, gathering his officers and the rank and file, he announced that, after nine years, they would be going home. The men were ecstatic, reduced to tears by the news, and called for great blessings upon the king. Now, to mark the end of their journey, the king ordered the construction of twelve giant altars, one for each of the gods of Olympus, perhaps to imply that giants once roamed these lands. The campaign in India was effectively over and most of the region was now pacified. The term pacified is a bit of a misnomer, however. The fighting in the lands of the five rivers was some of the most brutal and vicious seen thus far in Alexander's wars. There is a work done by historian A.B. Bosworth titled Alexander and the East, The Tragedy of Triumph. In it, he slams the conduct of Alexander in Central Asia and India, and draws an unflattering comparison to the Spanish conquest of Mesoamerica in the 16th century. Indian scholars have not had a bright opinion of Alexander either, particularly since the separation of the modern states of India and Pakistan from the British Empire in 1947, where some have even drawn parallels with Alexander being the prototype for Western colonialist incursions into India. Some go so far as to even elevate Porus to a nationalistic figure, in a similar vein to Arminius and Boudicca were by the German and British empires of the 19th century, and even claim that Poros had somehow managed to defeat the Macedonian king, but Eurocentric historians downplay the event entirely. Now, I find the last part rather laughable, but there is a level of validity in these arguments. The sources of Plutarch and Arian frowned heavily upon Alexander's behavior towards the Indian peoples, and we cannot forget the level of violence inflicted upon the region was nowhere equal to that in the rest of the empire, except perhaps Central Asia. One must wonder if this was just a coping mechanism on part of the Macedonians in dealing with such unfamiliar and hostile territories, a particularly murderous catharsis, or was this a megalomaniacal Alexander playing God and acting tyrannical at his fullest extent? Perhaps we'll truly never understand, but, for the time being, we must take our leave here. So will the Alexander and the Macedonians, who trekked thousands of miles up to this point. And the question is, what is the best way to get home? An army of ships, commissioned by the king some months prior, was being led along the Indus to rendezvous with the troops and aid in the return home. Conquering the empire through battle was one thing, but ruling it with the hearts and minds of the people was another. But to find out, we will have to wait until next time for the conclusion to The Age of Alexander.
So here we are, our second to last episode of the Age of Alexander. Twelve episodes in, and we still aren't in the Hellenistic period. Yes, yes, I know, you must all be very excited for the future of the show, and are perhaps looking to actually get to the meat of what the title of the show actually is all about. In truth, I was slightly hesitant of spending so much time with Alexander the Great, but I feel it was with good reason. His reign, though brief, helped create so many themes and motifs that carry throughout the rest of the Classical Age down to the period of the Roman Empire, and to dive right into the world of the Ptolemaics, the Seleucids, and the various other successor kingdoms without prepping you with the geography and the world before it, it would be a disservice. But don't fret, the next episode is going to be the final chapter in the Alexander Saga. By the time this episode is also out, I am going to be on vacation in Nova Scotia. And as much as I'd like to do research there, bringing 10 pounds worth of books across a plane is a bit difficult. The delay between episodes will not be long, maybe a few days at most. And I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show over the last few months. It has been quite the experience trying to fine-tune things out, seeing what works, but I think it's progressing along smoothly. If you are new to listener to the show, please consider subscribing to me on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and leave a 5-star review. You can also follow me on Twitter at HellenisticPOD, no space in between. You can listen for show updates or to just get in contact with me. All these links and sources used will be provided in the podcast description. Boy, I really need to make a website someday. Anyways, thanks again, and I will see you all next time with the next episode of the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>